Hi, I'm Ellie Dix from The Dark Imp and author of the book The Board Game Family. Welcome to Virtual Tabletop Gaming Live brought to you by Tabletop Gaming Magazine. Now, we all love playing games, but we don't always love playing with our family. We get really excited about games and the children don't always share our enthusiasm. So what can we do to make game playing at home with the family more harmonious, positive and fun? Here are my top tips for family board gaming. Tip one, choose the right game. This is super important. Just because you want to play a game and you're really excited about it and you've just received your Kickstarter version of it and, you, and you've been looking forward to it for months and you've been watching videos of other people playing it and you just can't wait to get it to the table, it doesn't mean that that's the right game to, to force your family to sit down and play with you. you. You need to be really careful when you're choosing games that what you're choosing is right for everyone at the table. And that's complicated and frustrating but it's going to help us to uh, embed board gaming as part of the culture of our family. And you'll be able to work up to those more, more complex games. You're going to get the buy in of your family as you progress through board gaming. Don't expect them to jump into the latest kind of heavy euro uh, at, at, with as much enthusiasm as you have. Also, you need to avoid really dangerous games. And by dangerous, I mean games that have a lot of conflict where there's a lot of take that in them. Some children can't handle that. Well, some adults can't handle that. You know your family best, so you know what they can cope with and what they can't. Uh, maybe look to avoid games where it's really clear all the way, all the time you're playing, who's in the lead. It stops some players feeling invested in what they're doing and thinking that they can catch up. You know, the runaway leader is can be quite depressing for a child. In fact, you know, I tend to look for games where it's not at all clear who's winning as you go through the game at all. Maybe you're working on your own tableau. Uh, maybe your resources are hidden, something like that. I mean, it's just not clear. There are loads of games like that available. So have a look for some of them. Games that rely on a particular skill that one person in the family doesn't really have, those might be considered dangerous games. You know, if you if you are playing uh, word games and you require quite a lot of vocabulary, they're not so good. You know, the adults are usually going to have an advantage over the children, which isn't really fair. If you're playing dexterity games and you've got a child who hasn't got great control of their fine motor skills, that's not really fair. That's not a level playing field to start with. So choose games where everybody can compete on a sort of a level playing field. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on as well. Avoid games with too much downtime in them. You know, children can deal with lots of complexity. They are dealing with complexity all the time, probably more than we can. They are learning machines. They are primed for it and used to it. But the downtime, they can't handle. The patience isn't there. So make sure that uh, you, you're either choosing games that have simultaneous play or really quick turns. Get their buy-in about what they want to play. You know, select games based on what the whole family is interested in or different members of the family so that you can, they, can, they can feel like they have a say about what they're going to play. And when you're choosing what games to play that day, have some system that allows them to feel like they've got some sort of... Uh, choice in the matter. So maybe it's, you know, you all take a turn choosing or maybe it's my favourite one is uh, one player chooses five games. The next player cuts that down, you know, five games that they would be happy to play. The next player cuts that down to four or three. The next player cuts that down. And so everybody's getting some sort of choice about uh, what, what games might go through. You can veto other people's suggestions. And then you've got a game at the end there that everybody's sort of happy to play. That's that that's a good way of doing it. Then think about cooperative games versus competitive games. Competitive games suit some families better than cooperative games. And that's partly because some my own children, for example, like to have control over their own choices. And uh, so, so they'll prefer to play a competitive game. They'll prefer to play and lose a competitive game than to be on a team, on a cooperative team and win. But they have been playing games for a really, really long time. And that's not the same with everybody. Cooperative games are really great for family, you know, for children who can't bear to lose, who really can't cope with losing. Um, 
if you're on a team or playing all together, then that might ease them into the game playing and know that if they lose, everyone loses. And if they win, everyone wins. It's, it's a, you're focusing more on the gameplay than the outcome. Tip two, learn before you teach. Oh, you know, this goes across all kinds of board gaming. You don't want to sit there teaching somebody how to play a board game while you're reading from the rule book. I mean, that's a normal tip. But with family gaming, it makes it so much more important, particularly if your family isn't yet fully into board gaming. You know, you're just trying to hook them in and trying to get them excited about it. Cut out all that learning time. Make sure they're not exposed to that. You do that yourself at a different point. And when they sit at the table, make sure it's, you're ready to play. I mean, you can even set up beforehand if you want to. Make sure you've played games through Use it, you know, on your own using all the pieces as if you're several people um, or you, you've you watched videos as well. You've really looked at the rule book. You've maybe even made a plan about what you're going to teach and when. You might choose when you start to introduce a new game to uh, introduce some rules of the game or the turn action so you can just get started. And, and children do not, most children do not want to sit and listen to long rules. So you're going to have to try and think of a way, even if it's a complex game, to get people started playing quickly. Uh, you may, if this, if this is an issue for your family, decide to teach different members of your family at different points. Yes, it takes longer. But what your job is, is to make sure that you have a positive gaming experience and that you're hooking in the family into board gaming. So if, if it would help to talk to one child who likes to learn in a certain way, or, you know, maybe if you have a child who's on the autistic spectrum, for example, they may wish to understand all the rules before they sit down and play. And another child may just want to get, just get me in and get me started. So plan how you're going to teach, possibly teach people separately and work out how you're going to get this started pretty quickly. You must really say, you know, the first time we play, this is a practice game. This is a learning game. And it doesn't matter what the outcomes are. In fact, I'm not even going to tell you all the rules before we start. I'm going to tell you some of the rules as we go along. And yes, you're going to say to me, oh, if I'd have known that, I would have played differently from the beginning. But this is a learning game. Now, the more that you do this with each new game you bring to the table, the more normal it will seem. And that's what the family will expect. They're just getting used to how to learn a new game. Also, try to hold yourself back from teaching strategy. You will feel like if you've been watching videos and listening to podcasts and you've worked out how to play it, you will have some strategic ideas in your mind, some, uh, you know, some way that you think that the game should be played or some uh, some ideas that you think everybody else sh should need to know. But actually teaching the strategy stops people from having the delight of learning it themselves. It's one of the main things we enjoy as board gamers, working stuff out, going, ah, yes, oh, I want to try that. And you're robbing the children and your, you know, any other adults you're teaching of that of that, of that real excitement of discovering things for yourself. Of course, tell them about the pitfalls, the really big pitfalls. If there are cards in the, the deck that are really unexpected and could stop a, a strategy from working, yeah, tell them about that. Um, and, and, and conversely, tell them about the big things that could push them forward. But, but try not to impose your idea of how to play the game on someone else because it's really fun to work it out yourself. Tip three, don't force participation. Now, this can be really frustrating. If you have been planning a game night with your family, and it, maybe even everybody knows that it's going to happen, and then one of the children or uh, an adult says, oh, I don't, I just don't feel like it. I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I don't want to play. Just don't force it. Don't force the issue. Even if it means that you can't then play that game that you plan to play. But play a different game. Don't ever force anyone to play at the table because it always, almost always ends in tears or arguments and it causes problems further down the line. Of course, now look, you know your children best. If your child is the kind of child that says, oh, I don't want to play, I don't want to play, I don't want to play and then really loves it when they get to the table, sure, fine. Coax them a little bit, kind of, you know, sweeten the deal a bit. And try and get into the table because then you, you'll know they'll enjoy it when they're there. But if you're not sure, don't risk it. 
what you're looking for is to have really positive gaming experiences all the time. So you want to make sure that you're not having any of those negative experiences or as few of them as possible. You're controlling what you can control and there's plenty you can't control, but you're, you're controlling what you can control. Someone says they don't want to play, don't make them play. If you're worried that the children might say they don't want to play, think about how you're framing the idea of playing. Now, are you saying, right, everybody, we're going to sit down and we're going to play this game and we're all going to play it and that's what we're doing? Or, or, or is it a much lighter exchange? Are you framing it in the sort of way that they have a choice about whether they play or not? Use stealth tactics to lure in teenagers that don't really want to play. Now, if you set up a weekly game night and you make it really clear that they're supposed to be there and that's what we're doing and, and that's what this family does, that can put off some teenagers who are really trying to find their own way and, and forge their own independence. But if you sneak up on them, it's much easier to hook them in. So, uh, for example, if you know that they're about you know, if you know when they're likely to be around in the communal area, living room or um, kitchen, set something up that you think might interest them. Prepare to play by yourself or with another adult, uh, but, but make sure that they can join in if they want to. Just try and trigger their interest a little bit. Now, when you're at dinner or sitting around the table, deal out some cards uh, or dominoes as you deal out the food. So that everybody's sitting together, you know, they know they're going to be sitting there for a while. In fact, it might even be quite um, a bonus for them if they can play a game and focus on the game instead of having to have the usual how is school today conversation. You can you may find that you're able to extend dinner times by five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, little by little. If you hook them in whilst they're whilst they expect to be with the family anyway then that time can increase and you can start to work into games. Tip four, use house rules. Yeah, I know this might be unpopular with some games designers, but really, you know, for family play, house rules are really super important. You can adapt games to suit your family better. Remember, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to be absolutely true to every game. We're trying to get our family to play games with us. And this is a this is a path. So if you have to adapt a game to start getting your family to the table, then you may be able to change it back to the real rules later on. So as they're young, if they're younger, you might want to adapt um, games for for length. So you can shorten the game to make it a, 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 a more potted experience. You might want to adapt games to level the playing field. You can uh, introduce sort of asymmetrical play or um, some handicap for a, for a player who's more um, experienced or older. What you want to do is make sure your house rules are keeping everyone playing in the game. So nobody's excluded and nobody feels like uh, this isn't the kind of game for them. You want games that the whole family wants to play and that the whole family can play and feel like they're competing on a relatively even level playing field. So you can introduce house rules that change the victory conditions, that adapt the player count, that change the setup so maybe you get different resources when you set up to uh, just push you forward a little bit at the beginning of the game and, and get that engine slightly built a little bit quicker. And you can also introduce house rules that uh, make game playing more harmonious. So if there are games that have got um, an element of take that in them, I'm not thinking of games that rely on take that, that the whole game hangs on that because you can't remove it from those games and it would be weird if you want, if you tried. But games that have one element of take that are some cards that allow you to attack another player, for example, whereas most of the cards, are fine, maybe 90% of the cards don't do that and 10% of the cards that are attacking another player, remove them. Just get rid of them. Um, that kind of thing is really going to help uh, the, the game playing be more harmonious, more positive experience and less recriminatory. The other benefit of uh, using house rules is it gives children the impression that they have some control over the design of the game, that that they can start experimenting with game design, that they can change little bits and see how they work. And it's hugely exciting to be creative in that way.
at school, creativity for children really hangs around the arts subjects and English. And they won't have very much experience of being creative in a sort of mathematical way. But board game design allows you to do that. And if you're just adapting games that you own slightly, it might give them a window into what a creative and exciting subject maths can be. Tip five, reinforce the behaviours you want to see. Every family has stories of messy explosions, table flipping, tears, arguments. Uh, and often those experiences can stop people wanting to play as a family altogether. But there's ways of dealing with these things and there's ways of minimising them. You need to be really clear in your own mind what you think positive behaviour is at the game table. And then you need to make sure you're looking for that in your children. I don't agree with the phrase, let sleeping dogs lie. It's a total nonsense. If you see children doing what you want them to do, then catch them doing that. Notice it, say, oh, that was, that was great what you did just then. I'm really proud of you. And I'm talking about things like rolling the dice and it's not a great roll. And they are dealing with their disappointment well. They're not throwing their hands up in the air and screaming and shouting because they wanted a six. They are dealing with the role they've got and are managing it. Notice that. Notice it. If they've been in a, a, a situation of conflict on the board and they've lost that particular conflict and they're not screaming and shouting, notice it. On, on the other side, bad winning can be as damaging as bad losing. So make sure that if somebody's just won that conflict and they're not going around crowing about it, if, if they are behaving appropriately, saying, oh, tough luck, that was a close one. That's great sportsmanship. Notice those behaviours. Catch them doing the right thing. Now that you have to model this stuff, of course, because you are the person that your children are going to look to for their behaviour cues more than anyone else. So make sure whatever you do, that you are being humble in victory and cheerful in defeat. If that's what you want your children to do, make sure you do it yourself. When issues do crop up, deal with them calmly and consistently. Oh my, it's so difficult. With your own children, it's so difficult to be calm and consistent and take a step back. But you have to have at the front of your mind all the time that your main job here is to get them into board gaming. That you want, to, and to do that, you're going to just have to rise above it a bit and deal with everything consistently. You are going to have moments where there, there's poor behaviour. Take a step back, count to 10 in your mind, deal with that behaviour calmly and consistently. Take the child outside the room if you want to. Just try not to escalate it with your own behaviour. It's really easy to say, it's not the winning that matters, it's the taking part that counts. Uh, but getting children, particularly children, also some adults, to really understand that is harder. You, know, you, you have to shift your focus away from the results and onto the choices that are made during the game. So try and avoid the big uh, hoo-ha at the end of the game about who's won and yay, give them a round of applause. Focus instead on the good choices that are being made during the game and make sure you're praising those. And of course, reward excellent sportsmanship. That's what you're looking for. Make sure that's what gets your praise, gets your attention, gets your smiles and your emotional response. Tip six, no rigged victories. Don't let your children beat you in a game. Of course, let them beat you. If they actually manage to beat you, they're brilliant. But don't play uh, at a lesser level so that they can win. It's just madness. Lots of parents do this and usually it's because the child can't cope with losing and we just want an easy life. And that's, you know, it's it's a really normal reaction to think, oh, I'm just, you know, I'll just let them win. It's so much easier. But you're creating this huge rod for your own back because the more that happens, the more you let them win, the more they'll need to win. 
and the less able they will be able to cope with failing and um, and not winning. Children learn from others. So if you're playing at half effort, you can expect them to play at half effort too. You know, board games have this wonderful ability to teach us so many learning skills and to help us with all sorts of things like uh, verbal and spatial reasoning, logic, problem solving, all sorts of things which have huge applications in our in our work, in our study and in our life. And if you're playing at half capacity, uh, then you don't access all those higher level uh, learning skills that you might otherwise access. Children excel when expectations are high. If you say to a child, I'm going to I'm going to really I'm going to play properly. I'm going to try and beat you and I probably will beat you. But I know that you're going to beat me one day. Now, I know that I can compete on a level playing field with you. And that's why I'm playing properly. Now, the child may lose. They may lose lots and lots and lots and lots of times. But when they win, they will know that they have genuinely won, genuinely beaten you. And the feeling that that will give them will be so enormous and such a delight. Losing a game teaches us how to fail. And it's really important, this uh, learning how to fail. And where better than in a game that really doesn't matter what the outcome is? I mean, it's not going to change anything. You know, if you can't fail at a board game, where can you fail? You're not going to be able to cope at school if you've handed in an assignment that doesn't meet the grade. You know, that you've you take a test and you don't manage to pass it. If you are used to failing playing games, you start to develop strategies to cope with losing. So I'm Ellie Dix from The Dark Imp. I hope you've enjoyed this video for uh, virtual tabletop gaming live. Uh, I've got some other videos that are available as well, so have a look at them. And head over to my website, thedarkimp.com, to see all the games that I create for families.